Um, I'm going to talk about practical applications of genomics in, in livestock farming. And just before we start, just to get everybody up to speed about what is genomics, so the bad news is you all share around 99% of your DNA with me, right? Also, you share around 98% of your DNA with a chimpanzee. Now, I'm sure you know somebody else who probably shares a little bit more than 98% of their DNA. Incidentally, you share around 50% of your DNA with a banana. So the, the same DNA profile exists irrespective of if, if it's on the tip of your toe or the tip of your nose. It's exactly the same DNA, and it's the same throughout your life. Incidentally, if you do kill anybody, the best way to get rid of DNA, the only way really to get rid of DNA is through bleach, and you can smoke like hell and get a DNA sample from inside in your cheek. It might be a little bit of uh, denaturing going on in there. So piece of useful, useful information to you. Jonathan already talked about the fact that we have around 3 billion pieces of DNA, so does a cow, um, and only around 40 to 50 million of those vary amongst us. So it's not that, that, that much. So what I'm going to talk about is all the DNA usages that, that are potentially available from a practical perspective. Okay? But before I start, most of what you've learned has all been wrong. Okay? So pedigree, when I present this to, to pedigree breed societies or herd books, they go, Jesus, what's, what's that? Your pedigree is all wrong. In, in the vast majority of cases. Even when you think it's right, it's actually wrong, right? Um, you may be unrelated to your brother or sister. Anybody here from Wales? No? OK. So you could also be unrelated to your grandparents, right? And I'm going to show you all of this in a second, right? Because most people don't believe me, except the people from Wales, of course. Do you actually know what the breed of your calves are? Phil, I'm going to be asking you in a second. I have a little bit of a quiz here where I'm mating a crossbred cow with a, with a pure, or a crossbred sheep, I, I think, with a, with a purebred ram. And we're going to know what's, what's the, um, the breed composition of the calf. And inbreeding is, is not always bad, right? These two guys, I, I couldn't get a, a more recent photo of Jonathan, but these two guys, obviously, <laughs> it's not always bad. Sometimes it is bad. Right, so these are all the usage you can have for, from genomics. And look, there's, there's a few more. The bottom right, I didn't look at the agenda for BSES, but I'd be very surprised if there's no talk about genomic evaluation. So I'm not going to talk about genomic evaluations, because that's what most people say, that this is what DNA is useful for. Also, and you'd hear a lot, and Jonathan talked a lot about this PLF, precision livestock farming, and lots of talks about it. Nobody ever really talks about the cost. I'm a farmer myself. From a practical perspective, number one thing is, what's it going to cost me? And then I'll work out what the return on investment is. And everybody always asks me, well, what's the cost of the chip? How much are you getting the chip for? This is the DNA gene genotyping chip. And what I want to show you here is that the chip is only actually a fraction of the cost. Right? These are just roughly costs. I've converted them to sterling for s collecting the sample. Right? So you've got to post this, the sample out, or post the, the sampling mechanism out. The sample has to be taken and posted back. That's a cost. Right? Extract the DNA. But as you can see, the chip is only really around half the cost. So there's a load of pressure on the two companies like Illumina and Afrimetrics. Oh, can you reduce the cost of the chip? I would argue there's probably more to be give in the other, in the other parts. And of course, this doesn't include profit going all the way through the system as well. Tax, obviously, from a 23% perspective, is, is a huge component there as well. So let's, let's dive into them, and let's go on a whirlwind tour really, really quickly through them. From a parentage perspective, everybody here has two strands of DNA, one you got from your father and one you got from your mother. Okay? So here we have the sire on the top. All our DNA is just A, C, Gs, and Ts. That's all it is. So he's got two strands, and the bottom one, is that offspring on the bottom truly the sire, or truly the progeny of that sire? So what you can see is that there's one strand in common. So that offspring inherited that strand from that particular sire's sperm, therefore that is the sire. Easy peasy, right? Look at this scenario. Is this offspring the, the true offspring of that particular sire that the farmer recorded? No. None of those strands of DNA or those alphabet of DNA actually link up. So therefore, that's incorrect. The good thing about having a genomics program, a large genomics program, of course, is that you have a database of all the potential SARS in the population. Right? So then you can trawl through this database, and you can figure out, go back to the farm. So again, this is a little bit like what, what Jonathan was talking about, precision livestock farming. To me, a lot of the time, is doing a lot of predict prediction but it's not doing a lot of prescription or diagnosis. Here, we're identifying the problem, but then we're prescribing, well, what's the solution? That's the solution. That was not, that was the incorrect SAR. This is the correct SAR, OK? In, in Ireland, our, our errors in dairy are around 7.5%. They're around 17% in beef, and around 13% in, in sheep. And more and more, as we accumulate our data, 
our genotype database, we're actually able to correct a lot of these. So around 60 to 80 percent of the time, we can actually um, identify the true star. Traceability, very, very easy. You can see the animal there, and you can see that the meat sample is a direct, they're exactly the same. We're not linking half here because the, the, the meat came from the animal. And similarly, from, a, from the other perspective then, there's no commonalities in their DNA. Now, what's really interesting is actually the ability to, to diagnose high somatic cell count animals using this type of technology from bull tank milk samples. Because bull tank milk samples, the cell counts are essentially just white blood cells, so you can DNA those, and if you have uh, the, a large number of them coming from a particular animal, you can identify which animal, assuming that you have the animal's genotype, of course, which is the high cell count animal. Moving on then to, to the other uses, um, most people will be familiar with the Belgian blue. Um, this bull double mustang, that's just a single mutation in one single gene, so actually a bit of a chunk taken out of the myostatin gene. There was a perception years ago that people were going to find all these genes, we'd edit them and we'd breed from them and everything will be fine. They're not out there, right? There's a few of them out there. There's the fecundity genes in the sheep. There's things like this, the calipige in, in the sheep and, the, and the, uh, the myostatin in the Belgian blue. But there's not many else out there for the traces that were currently recorded at least, right? We're doing so much analysis, we'd have found these a long, long time ago, okay? Yet they are there. And what we're seeing is the integration of a lot of these, these mutations into um, other breeds like the Angus. I go to a lot of Angus talks where people are saying, um, should we have this myostatin in our breed? Well, that's a herd book's decision. Here's the pros and here are the cons. You make a decision as a breed society. But at the very least, let's monitor. Is it on its increase or is it reducing? Congenital defects is hard enough to see, but that heifer there is missing half a nose. On the bottom, if we look at the DNA profile of this animal and, and its contemporaries, um, on the bottom there is the, all the chromosomes. You can see that large spike. That's the gene that's associated with that half the nose missing a, cl a cleft palate. So you say, Jesus, well done, you found it. There's 2.4 million potential sites in that spike where that mutation could truly exist. So it literally is trying to find a needle in a haystack. There is a perception that these things are really easy to do, really, really difficult. We haven't found it, right, where that mutation actually is. For the vets in the room, any problem with those, that heifer or that hogget? The hogget looks a bit scrawny, all right, but can you see any issue with that heifer? No, you can't. None of those are going to go in calf. Neither of the two of them can go in calf because all the females in this room carry two, carry, two copies of the X chromosome. Those two females only carry one. And we could have told the farmer, that heifer was, is a three-year-old. She was bred as a, as a 15 month twice, didn't go in calf, bred again 12 months later. We could have told the farmer 24 months earlier, she's not going to go in calf. She's, got a, she's only got one X chromosome, right? And just last week, we found um, Swire syndrome, which is a heifer with the DNA, or sorry, it's a female with the DNA of a male. Again, impossible for go, those to go in calf. So we would have autopsied that that one as well. So that's a karyotype abnormality. Karyotype refers to the number of chromosomes that you have. Most people will be familiar with Down syndrome. That's where you have three copies of the chromosome 21. Looking at uh, inbreeding and mating advice. So here's where I said all pedigree is wrong. So let's, let's go to work the example and just prove to you that you may actually be unrelated to your gra grandparents, one of your grandparents, and may be unrelated to your sister or your brother, as the case may be. So I told you earlier, every one of us has two copies of, of DNA. So let's look at that bull there, two green pieces of DNA, the cow beside them, two red pieces of DNA. They mate, biology has to happen, it's produced a bull calf, half the DNA came from the sire, so red from the, from the dam, half the DNA from the, sorry, half the DNA from the sire, green from the sire, red from the dam. Similarly, some other farm doesn't really make a difference, happens on the other side. Uh, heifer born this time, half the DNA from the sire, so yellow from the sire, blue from the dam, okay? So these two mate, produce a heifer calf, again biology, half from the sire, so red from the sire, and blue from the dam. They could even be non-identical twins, or let's just pretend they were born a year later from exactly the same mating. Bull calf this time, green from the sire, yellow from the dam. What's the relationship between those two animals? Full brothers and sisters, exactly the same, uh, exactly the same parents. What color have they in common in their DNA? None, completely unrelated. Also, what you'll notice is the bull could actually mate with its grandmother and result in no inbreeding. Don't try this at home, kids, right? 
But that doesn't really happen. And in reality, you've lots of crossing over. But the point I'm trying to get across is, is that relationships are expected relationships. So you think you share half your DNA with your brother and sister. And on average, you do. But there is a deviation amongst that. And genomics is the only tool that will enable us to actually be able to work that one out. If you don't believe me, these are two famous bulls, Edison Slogan and Edison Addison. They stood in New Zealand, in, in Holland. They're well proven. If we look at their Irish proofs, just look at the very top one. Slogan was in the bottom 21% for milk yield. And his full brother was in the top 98% for milk yield. Very different bulls, yet identical parents. Okay. Here's the one about inbreeding being bad. So a lot of us would look at what we call the global inbreeding. We'd say, oh, well, if you mate the, the cow with the, with the, or mate two full, full brothers, or two full brothers, mate two full siblings, 25% inbreeding. But if the inbreeding was in places where it doesn't have an effect, how is that bad? So like only around 1%, one to 2% of our genome, of our DNA, actually does something that we know of at least. So 98% of our DNA we could call maybe junk. And if inbreeding is happening there, what happened? What, what bother does it, is it, right? We also know that if inbreeding is slow and done tandem with selection, it actually can be favorable as well. So moving on to breed composition. Um, so we have, oh, we need to be very careful for GDPR reasons that we don't disclose identification of anybody. So here we have a Suffolk ram mated with a Texel or a Clin, actually Clin, uh, yo, I, I was getting back at the, the Welsh here, sorry. Um, yo, and that produces a crossbred animal, right? And here's one now for you, Phil, right? Mated to a Charolais ram. Oh, I give you the answers. Oh, that should have animated in. But if you mated a purebred Charolais with a crossbred Clin Suffolk, everybody here would say 25% Clin, 25% Suffolk, 50% Charolais. But based on the last slide, you actually don't know. So usually when I ask people, they start shouting out answers, I say you're wrong, because you have to be wrong, because you can't know. So that animal could actually be 50% Suffolk with no clen, or it could be 50% clen with no Suffolk. Because of the way that DNA is, is, is segregating or is, is sampled during the production of oocytes and, and sperm. So what you can do, of course, with genomic technologies, and this is, this is a real life example, we just gave a computer program a load of DNA, and we said, look for similarities in that DNA profile. And what it did, it made loads of little blobs, right? And then we knew who the breed was. So when we colored those blobs, look what happened. All the Angus clustered, this is called the principal component analysis, all the, the, the Angus is clustered up to the top. The host and Frisians, you can see a long streak because they're similar. Inter incidentally, I, I went to present this to the Frisian AGM. I said, Jesus, I can't present that. But of course, later I realized that the Frisian actually came from the Belgian Blue. Or sorry, the Belgian Blue actually came from the Frisian, right? So you can see the Belgian Blue is close to the Frisian. Cementals, limousines, Charolais, all similar geographical origins. So they're all, DNA is pretty similar. So if you have a piece of meat and you want to know where does that piece of meat come from, you can DNA sample it, that will tell you it's a Hereford. Or it might fall in between the two of them. It's a crossbred Hereford, Hust and Frisian. Okay. And if you ever get yourselves DNA'd or sequenced, so that's mine. Um, and you can see that it's exactly the same technology. So I'm 85.8% British. I have a bit of French and German in me as well. But it's exactly the same technology. Or, or algorithms used to determine what the breed composition of an animal is to know what the breed composition of myself is. So then finally, and if I'm looking for a stepwise change, um, there's two things. Reproduction, I think, will be a stepwise change, change in, in how we manage things. We have focused till now really on the star line. I think the dam line has a lot to give us. And the other one is going to be on precision management. Just to give you a really quick example, if you look at the genetic proofs of a Belgian blue bull, some of them will be okay for easy cal for calving, right? So easy calving. Now, if you put that bull onto a Frisian cow, a good Frisian cow, probably will be easy calving. But if you put that Belgian blue bull onto a Belgian blue cow, exactly the same Belgian blue bull, if you put it onto a Belgian blue cow, it's coming out the side, 100% cesarean. So this is a genome-enabled mating advice. We're telling the farmer, based on the dam, this is what the sire is, is likely to produce. But of course, I told you earlier, you can't predict things with 100% certainty because you don't know what's inside in those million of sperm that, that, that in each ejaculate of the bull. Similarly, if we look at, and this is an important thing in, from a daring perspective, which one of those calves is worth more? All you really know by looking at them is the color. They're both Angus crossbreds. 
right? But what if we were to actually look at the genetic merit of those by knowing the breed composition, but knowing their expected growth, their expected uh, efficiency, etc., we can get a more accurate reflection of the true genetic potential and profitability and sustainability metrics potentially of those particular animals. So with that, take home message, hopefully I've convinced you, is that there's a huge amount to take from genomics and I've just really just the tip of the iceberg. But I think that whole precision management is, is where the future is going to be. Thank you.